Hey everyone, I hope this finds each of you so very well. I'm speaking to you today from my studio in West Orange, New Jersey. Absolutely delighted to once again welcome author, coach, consultant, financial services professional, and public speaker David Richman back to Grief and Rebirth podcast. Be sure to check out my fascinating podcast interview with David about his beautifully written and incredibly moving book titled Cycle of Lives, 15 People's Stories, 5,000 Miles, and a Journey Through the Emotional Chaos of Cancer, which portrays 15 individual cancer stories as it also shares David's amazing journey riding his bike 5,000 miles coast to coast, meeting each of the individuals featured in his book in person along the way. David has graciously offered to share his own remarkable story of rebirth as a contribution to our uplifting grief and rebirth rebirth series. I'm looking forward to chatting with him about how he escaped his first marriage to an abusive alcoholic and got his then four-year-old twins, who are now grown up, to a better place. How he used that experience, in addition to his sister's diagnosis of brain cancer, to stop smoking and lose 50 pounds, and his amazing journey going from sedentary to becoming an impressive endurance athlete, completing 18 Ironman triathlons and hundreds of other endurance events. By the way, David was born in Miami, and I have to say that means something because I grew up in Miami. I'm not quite sure if that's good or whatever, but we both had that Miami connection, and he was raised mostly in the L.A. area, and he is now very happily remarried. David, you are such an incredible role model in so many ways. I'm truly honored and happy to chat with you today about your awesome journey from grief to rebirth. Welcome back to the podcast. <laughs> Thank you, Irene. I was so looking forward to uh, to talking to you because I had such a great time with you the first time when I told my wife that we were going to be talking again. She went, oh my God, how happy are you? So I'm very yeah. happy. Thank you. That makes two of us, really. And the only thing's missing is a glass of wine. And we'll talk about <laughs> our experiences here. Yep. <laughs> So let's begin because you have this such an you're such an amazing guy and you have such an incredible story of rebirth. So tell us, tell everyone about your childhood, your relationship with your cherished sister, June, mm -hmm. and your first marriage to an abusive alcoholic. How did you escape that first marriage and save your then four year old twins who I understand are a boy and a girl, right? Mm -hmm. so they are. Yeah. Well, it's, it, it's just, you know, I mean, the, it's hard to talk about only because, you know, we just live our own lives. And, and sometimes when you're, when you force yourself to reflect on it, it seems a little more dramatic than what it was. Cause when you're living it, you're just living your life, right? Right. It, it's when you, it's when you look back on it that you go, Oh my gosh, like what the heck was I doing? Or could you imagine what I went through? Everybody goes through very difficult times. Um, no, nobody escapes that. Right. So, um, it's just a matter of how you come out. Like what you constantly talk about is how you, how you rebirth yourself out of these situations. And for some, um, they, they, they do it real easily and they do it early in life. For me, it came later in life. And I think that's because I took my childhood so harshly. Um, I had a, in short, I had a mom who, when she married her husband, she was 18 and her husband was 56 when they got married. Oh my goodness. Yes. And so uh, when, when I was born, my sister was a year and a half older than me, but when I was born, um, my mom was 21 and my dad was 59. And so, uh, you know, and the reality of it, which I didn't know at the time, but I've, I've come to, to, to understand the reality of it was it was just that she didn't really want kids and didn't like kids and certainly didn't like her own kids um he was too old because she was too young she, she just wanted to live her life but she was now stuck with this situation and she was not a happy person she was 
uh, quite abusive, very unpredictable, um, uh, you know, not, not, not a wonderful, not a wonderful person. Uh, my, my dad, on the other hand, was a wonderful person, but he was, you know, nearly, you know, 60 years older than me. And so when the world, and, you know, so he was too old to have kids. And back when I was young, 60 years old was old, you know, now 60 years old is like, man, you're just getting started. And so um, we had, I had that dynamic growing up. And so that I, not only because my sister and I were only 18 months apart, but because we could only rely on each other, you know, we grew up at that time when you don't talk back to your parents and you don't, you're not in the room you know, unless they want you in the room and you certainly aren't going to ask questions. I grew up talk- with a little bit of that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like, like it, it just, the things are the way they are and you don't question them, it, but it doesn't make them any better. It may, may, may make it worse, but my sister and I were the only ones that, that could understand what the other was going through. Right. Because we couldn't talk to anybody about it. In fact, it was, it was hilarious. Just as a side note, when I was, uh, in my thirties, I ran into a woman who grew, who, who had her own family had, that had grown up on the street that we grew up on. And all the families had kids that grew up on the street. And she told me, she goes, Oh my God, we were so at that whole neighborhood felt so bad for you guys because your dad was so old and your mom was so mean. They go, Oh my God, that, you know, you guys had it so, so tough. And so um, we had each other and, and that was, that was the thing that made us close. And we weren't always super close in the amount of time we spent together, or talked with each other, but, it was um, connection. But, but the connection was close. Right. And, and certainly when uh, one of us needed the other, the, the connection was, was really close because we both understood each other in that special way. Um, I got to interrupt and ask yeah. you, what was it that led your mother and your father to get married? Um, I think the short answer is that she came from a very abusive household and How it needed, they keep themselves? yeah, and needed to escape. Um, he, on the other hand, was this amazing changes profession every 10 years, entrepreneur, inventor, playboy, you know, one, this wonderful, you know, older guy that, you know, I mean, why wouldn't he want to? marry a beautiful 18 i mean that sounds kind of gross right now but no, why no, but, it sounds, but, but it's true i mean That's but at that time yep. you know i mean he was he was like a, a you know think about a rat packer like right. frank sinatra didn't right, marry right. women his own age you know what i'm saying right and so he was, he, he was her way out yeah he was her way out and absolutely and, and was she was his, his way to stay young and right. so i i understand that it, it makes sense um and so but the problem is, is that I, I uh, grew up very unaware of the world and very uh, isolated, um, self-isolated too, because I didn't have anybody to talk to. I was a sensitive kid. I didn't understand anything that went on and I couldn't talk to really anybody about it because, <clears throat> you know, neither parent was available to talk to and there wasn't any other role model that I could. So I didn't, I was not equipped to deal with the fallout from that. And at 18, I left home. And through a series of events, I had some very, very bad experiences, was homeless even for, for a little bit, oh um, uh, uh, got robbed, robbed at gunpoint very early in that, that endeavor. It was just, it was absolutely horrible. And so I, I, I kind of was always uh, focused on just survival and trying to figure out how to get my feet on, on the ground, um, which I did. And I, and I worked hard and I, and I was very look successful. Look at how amazing you are, because that, yeah. that alone, before you lived the rest of your life, that alone would have been enough to sink somebody. Yeah. And, it, and at times I felt like I was sinking, but I didn't want, I, I wanted to be something special, which in my case was just a normal life, right? No matter how, what, what, you know, special, if special is normal, anything above that is great. Right. So, right. so I, I, but I never felt like I could ever get that normal life because I had to fight harder. I had to dig myself out of a bigger hole. I, I, I was not equipped to make good emotional decisions. And so I got myself into bad situations, which is what led to that relationship with my uh, first wife. Well, first was, of all, even before you say another word, I just got to say, you had your experience of a woman with someone who was not kind and mean. And so now you, now you're this, you didn't know how to make sense of your first wife and who she was. It was, it was like familiar in a way. Yeah, well, um, some people will call me smart, but not very quick, because I 
obviously, it's so plainly obvious that I, what I was trying to do was to marry my mom so that I could make her happy. And, uh, you know, I mean, all, I mean, you know, I mean, it's a, yeah. it's a super obvious pattern that you would want to say to the person that's going to repeat it. Whoa, 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 dude, stop, stop. I can literally stop. You're, you can't marry your alcoholic father, right? You can't marry your angry mother. I mean, you can't do those things. Um, and, and it's so plain when you've seen it in, 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 in retrospect or when you see it in somebody else, but when I was going through it, I did just didn't know. And uh, I think part of re rebirth is, is forgiving yourself for not knowing what you didn't know then. Absolutely. And, you know, and, and, and had you known better, you would have done something different, but you didn't know any better. And so you just have to forgive yourself and move on. And, but it took me a while. It took me a while to get there. But when I finally uh, realized, and, and it was at, through the help of a friend, Irene, who, who told me um, when I kept complaining about my ex-wife and I kept complaining about how mean she was and how difficult it was to not fight back. Cause if I fought back one time, who knows what could happen, right? So I just had to take what she was giving. You, were worried, you already back. had the kids and you were worried about the kids too, right? Oh, absolutely. And so I was complaining to him on a very regular basis. And he finally just slapped me across the face and said, dude, she's not the problem. You're the problem. You're, it's a hundred percent your fault. And I'm like, and I went, I, I, what, how in the world, what are you talking about? And he goes, dude, he goes, you are a sensitive, observant, wonderful person that's willing to change. She's an angry, miserable person who doesn't know any better. Like, like, why are you thinking that she'll change? She doesn't, she's not aware. She doesn't want to change. She's not going to change. And you're the one that keeps trying to get her to be something she's not. Why don't you stop worrying about her? And why don't you worry about yourself? And I went, holy crap. And then about that same time in a fight that where in which she became incredibly violent, she started screaming at me that, that I'm not your mother. I'm not your mother. And I went, Oh shoot. You're exactly that. Yeah. 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 You are. And, and then it hit me that I'm the problem. I got to fix, I got to fix this situation, but I don't have to fix it just for me. I obviously have to fix it for my kids. I, I put them in this situation and they deserve better. I deserve better. Not only um, that, and, but you and your sister struggled with an abusive mother. Yeah. And now you have two kids who are going to be struggling with an abusive mother. So again, yeah. it repeated the pattern yeah. that way also, right? Yeah, yeah totally. And, and um, you know, look, I, I, we, we, not, we don't like braggarts, right? We, we, we don't like people that brag about themselves. The, the one thing I will tell you I've done well in my life is raise my kids well. Um, because I, you, you can brag about that. You, you brought well, some good people into the world. That's important. Right. <laughs> but, 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 but part of the reason is, is because I really didn't want to repeat the patterns that would have been easy for me to repeat and that I repeated earlier, right? Like I, I, I just, I, I must've told them a thousand times, I'm sorry. I gave you such a bad mother, right? That I could have made a better decision. I, I literally could have made a better decision. Right. And so I didn't say I, I, I owned up to that. And which is again, a part of the forgiveness process is accepting that it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to, to be wrong. It's just not okay if you continue to do the same thing wrong. And it's not okay if you just sweep it under the rug and don't try to make amends for it to yourself or to your loved ones. That's what makes it wrong. And so, um, you know, I, I, I came and, and at that same time, my sister was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. Man. And so here I am, I'm, I'm not in contact with my mom. My dad has long since died. My sister's going to die. I've got an abusive uh, woman that I, I got to get me and my kids to safety. So it was a world of turmoil. Now, uh, compared to a lot of people, it's not that bad, right? But well, it was listen, my turn. You had plenty on your plate. It was, it was yeah. hard. It was hard. You know, and so, uh, and I was an overweight smoker, miserable, stressed out, you know, I mean, yes, I was successful in some ways and I had some good friends and, you know, my life wasn't total crap, but there was a lot of negativity there. And I was in a place that I didn't want to be. And, and most of it was of my own cre creation. Um, uh, and I needed, to, I needed to, 
to move on. I needed to figure out a way to, to reinvent myself. And, and that's, that's kind of where all, all of the change started to take place. So now when you went to divorce her, was she miserable about that? Give you a hard time, give the kids a hard time. It sounds like you could total, you got custody of your kids, right? Well, so uh, to be fair, um, the divorce process was very simple because I had some leverage and we don't need to get into the details, okay. but the leverage was just was going to allow me to uh, not drag the kids through a really bad divorce. And so uh, that leverage, I used it to say, let's do no courts, no fighting over money, no whatever. I do the driving, you know, uh, uh, no, you know, we, we were, we were, so you able, were able to make it amicable enough. It was not make- amicable, but we were able to do it in a way that wasn't absolutely brutal. And um, we still, we've only one time talked face to face and that was for less than two minutes. And that's, that's 20 years later. So wow. it, 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 it's not a, it's not a pretty situation. Certainly it was not amicable at all, but I was able to, to, once the break was going to happen, the break was able to be made without a, a long prolonged process. You know, you know, you hear about a lot of these situations where people have to deal with that situation for years and the trauma on everybody, no matter who's right or wrong, right. the trauma on everybody is just is just so unnecessary. And we were able to avoid that for her, for me, for the kids. Um, you know, she she wasn't real pleased with it, but I, but it was great for the kids. So that's great. So now you've got this whole thing. You're 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 getting your kids out of the situation. You're getting out of your first marriage, and boy, I'll bet you were relieved. Mm-hmm. And now you find out about, and you've got June's diagnosis going on. How did you stop smoking and lose 50 pounds? I mean, with everything else you're going through, holy moly. I mean, that's talk about willpower and being strong minded. How were you able to over and those uh, that eating and that smoking was probably a way you fed yourself for emotions that were not Mm -hmm. being fulfilled, right? Yeah. And, And just to close the book on 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 her, let's be fair maybe there could have been somebody that came along at the point in her life when I came along that would have been better for her. That would have been somebody that could have made her happy or taught her how to reflect on her behaviors or made her her best person. I wasn't that person. So, um, you know, I'm not saying it's a hundred percent her fault. It's just, it, it just, it just didn't work out. Right. So let's, let's be fair that, that, you know, it's not, it wasn't, Oh, I walked into the situation where I'm 100 percent the victim. That's just not it. It's just no. You're talking made about a bad how you decision. empowered yourself. Yeah, you're not a victim. You're, you're, right. you're, I'm arguing with you because we're not, it's not that you're a bad guy saying you you did everything right and she didn't. But look at how you empowered yourself for your kids. Yeah, yeah. And so I did do a bad behavior. So I didn't. I wasn't violent and I wasn't angry and I wasn't um, a miserable person. I wasn't a jerk as a boss. You know, I, I didn't do, I, I, you know, I didn't do drugs. I wasn't, you know, I didn't do a lot of the things that maybe would be easy to do to mask those, those situations, but I was an overweight smoker. I was uh, very stressed out. I wasn't being a healthy role model for my kids. Um, I, 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 I maybe wasn't making the best decisions, um, uh, you know, just in life. And I said, well, you know what, I, I, I just, and I think we talked about this before is I just stood in front of the mirror the the kids were asleep they were like four years old i just found out my my sister had brain cancer i'm i'm in a place at a house where i'm safe and there's nothing you know going on there's no nonsense that's going to happen to me um and i just stood in front of a mirror one night looking at myself going like who do you want to be like who who are you like who 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 are you and who do you want to be because all I knew was that I spent my childhood trying to make a mom happy who I couldn't make happy. Every job I had, I thought I had to work harder to make the boss happy or to, to survive where, you know, so I was doing it for them. Uh, you know, any relationship I had was trying to fix whatever bullshit, whatever problems I had in my childhood, especially that marriage. And so I was doing it for all the wrong reasons. I never did anything for me. And, and, and I don't mean selfish for me. I mean, and not even self-serving, but just of self-worth or self-value. <clears throat> and so I said, you know, who are you and who do you want to be? And what I 
I knew was I didn't want to be a smoker. I didn't want to be overweight. I didn't want to be miserable. And I didn't want to continue to try to do things to impress everybody else. I said, why don't you start to impress the guy in the mirror? Why don't you wow, just try that for healthy. That is, you weren't even in formal therapy or anything. You no. came upon all this. Mm -mm. There are people, many people have to do a lot of self Ex examination with someone else's help to come to that that's amazing that you were able to come to that conclusion yeah it was it was a tough one but it was very empowering in, in a way that was like you know i think i could have easily irene i think i could have easily um had a lot of guilt and um had a lot of remorse and i could have beat myself up pretty easily for making bad decisions and putting myself and my kids in a bad, in a bad place. And, you know, not, not having lived a good, you know, my best life or, or whatever. Um, but I just said, no, you, you know, I mean, why don't you look at the positive? Why don't you be an optimist? Why don't you see who you want to become? And why don't you, you know, when I wrote that first book, winning in the middle of the pack, it's this idea of, like, I finally decided that it didn't matter that nobody was watching and nobody cared. In fact, that's a great place when nobody's watching and nobody cares, but the person in the mirror, that's a wonderful place. And, and so I started to rely on how do I feel about myself rather than impressing my boss or impressing the girl or, or, or thinking that I have to do things because I, I think that's what everybody else's expectation of me is. And, you know, people can do that by being self-centered and being a jerk, or they can do it by being on a road of self-discovery and trying to figure out, you know, what's the best thing they can be. And so like an example is when I, when I, when I would make dinner for my kids, right. I didn't do it for them. I did it for me. Right. And, and it's like, oh man, I want to, I want them to have a good meal. Not, I want them to, to say, oh, my dad's a good cook and it's all about him. And right. You know, it's, you understand yes, the subtle difference? I totally yeah. get that. Totally yeah. get that. How long did it take you to, to um, <clears throat> stop smoking? I mean, did you go cold turkey the next day? And, yeah, and so lose that weight. All right, you're cooking better for yourself and all, but that's <laughs> that takes time. So uh, a lot of the time in my life, uh, growing up, I couldn't be weak or couldn't show that I was failing at something because m the household wouldn't have allowed it. As a young adult on my own, I couldn't fail because. Uh, yeah, if I did fail, I might be homeless and out on the street, right? <clears throat> and then later in my young adulthood, I didn't want to fail because I wasn't used to failing and I didn't want to be known as a failure. And so it's pretty funny, but I always tell people, I never tried to quit smoking because I didn't want to fail at it. Wow. That's, that's the reason why, because I didn't want to be that person because once it becomes okay to fail, it becomes okay to fail. You, you know, you look at the, 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 the old adage of the, 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 the uh, tightrope walker, the tightrope walker doesn't have a safety net underneath because if it's okay to fall when they don't have a net, they'll fall. They practice without a net for one reason. It's never okay to fall. Wow. And so I, I lived this life where I just didn't want to fail. So I actually, when I decided to quit, I, I literally quit and never picked up another cigarette because I didn't want to fail at it. So that's so admirable. Um, that's so admirable. Well, it, but but it's it, it's also I probably could have quit ten years earlier if I was willing to give it a try, right? But I I wasn't ever willing to give it a try. So um so I quit and I said to to make sure that I don't fail, I got to do something that will occupy my time or, or be counter to smoking. And what's the one thing that's counter to smoking is is exercising. You, you can't swim and smoke a cigarette at the same time. You can't run and smoke a cigarette at the same time, unless you're a complete whack job. You know, you can't be on a bicycle, right. You know, riding a bike, you know, fast and smoke. So I just filled every minute I could with doing healthy things so that I wouldn't pick up a cigarette. And those things helped you lose the weight too, because now you're Absolutely. better and now you're exercising. Yes. Wow. And so I went from this was, uh, I quit in the first week of, of a February when my kids had just turned five. So I quit the first week in a February. And by that November, I did my first Ironman. So I went from wow. like complete nothing to having done an Ironman in like eight months, nine months. That's amazing. Was anyone coaching you or you were doing this also totally on your own? Did you take yourself to a 
facility and have someone no 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 uh where you see these days there are all these programs on tv you can ride and they're incurred none of that for you, you none mean. of that the one thing i did was i asked a guy who was a, a, a an endurance athlete to teach me how to run because i was when i was on the volleyball court playing playing beach volleyball every now and then um uh, some people told me i i, I was a very ugly runner and that's because i wasn't a runner I, I never run. How, how are you going to smoke I didn't know there's a difference in a beautiful and an ugly runner. Well, an ugly runner will hurt themselves. I didn't want to hurt myself. Oh. And so, so I needed to get taught how to run. And when he took me out to, to learn how to run, I literally couldn't run for two straight minutes at a very slow pace. That's how poor out of shape. Two minutes. Right now, if I forced you, you could hold your breath for two minutes. I couldn't run for two minutes. It's just right. stupid. And so... But no, I did it on myself because um, I guess uh, out of out of necessity or out of out of uh, guilt or whatever, I always was self-reliant. I had I had to be right. Um, and so um, I, I what I never did is I never forced myself to do things for me. And so I, I knew I could outwork anybody. I knew I could outsmart anybody. I knew I could. Right. If I'll do whatever it takes to get whatever done. But I was always doing that for the wrong reasons. Now I just said, so I said, oh, well, shoot, man, why can't you do an Ironman? Go do an Ironman. And then when I did that, I go, well, why can't you run 50 miles? Why can't you run 100 miles? Why can't you bike 5,000 miles? You can, because if you tell yourself you're going to do it, you, of course you can do it. You're very strong minded. It's so admirable. <laughs> really, you really are. It's, it's fantastic. I learned from a lot of bad mistakes. <laughs> Well, that's another thing. You're very honest with yourself, which is great. You're, they call this in the spiritual terms. They say you're a conscious human yeah. being. You're really aware. Um, so all of this congealed to inspire this new purpose in you, which was to tell these evocative, inspiring stories, which produced cycle of lives to help people overcome trauma, grief, and limiters of all sorts and develop a better tool set to communicate with others about difficult emotions. How did that all come about while you're cycling, running and doing everything? All of a sudden you go, well, I'm going to, I'm going to start writing. I mean, how did this all, this was part of your rebirth. How did this. It is part, part of rebirth. And, and, you know, I, I love it when somebody discovers something like you have later, later in life. Right. Uh, and maybe later in life for them as they discovered it in their 20s or they whatever. Who, I'm not making a judgment of late in life, just later right. in life where you but discover yeah. something and it becomes the thing that helps define you and, and opens your eyes to the world. It might be music. It might be yoga. It might be meditation. It might be art, whatever it is. For me, it was endurance athletics. And when I found myself um, drawn to endurance athletics, not just because it got me and kept me healthy and not just because it made me um, feel a, a sense of self-worth and accomplishment for me, which was, which was important, right. For me at the time, but because it gave me a wonderful place of contemplation and um, I'll, I'll never, I'll never forget one of the, one of the most ridiculous training things I ever did was I had made a, a, a pact with my sister. She was uh, getting ready to die. And um, there was a, a American Cancer Society Relay for Life, which is one of these things where a bunch of people get together. They, uh, you know, they, they hang out at a high school uh, a track. And for 24 hours, they, a team gets together and they walk around the track and it's cancer awareness and support. And it's this wonderful community thing. And it raises money and a sense of community and it's sharing and it's this whole thing. And she had a big team of people that were going to be there to uh, uh, be on the track in her honor. And she wanted to be there for the whole event. Okay. And um, I made a pact with her. If you're going to be there for the whole event in your condition, I'll run for the whole 24 hours. Wow. And so to prepare for that, I literally, uh, I, on one day of training, I did a half Ironman, which I drove three hours to the event the night before, woke up super early, did a half Ironman, drove three hours home. When I got home, I took a shower, put on running shoes and did a 10 mile run. Holy moly. And I thought to myself, you know, I had to do this 10 mile run because I'm preparing to run for 24 hours. 
And so I needed to have something that would reflect that. And all I kept thinking about as I'm, as I'm, as I'm running around uh, the track for, for, you know, it was maybe close to midnight. It was freezing cold out and I was tired as hell as I just kept thinking about all these wonderful thoughts that were coming into my head about my childhood with my sister and about the things that I had learned from doing endurance athletics and how grateful I was to be able to be at my age at that time to be able to do something like this, you know, to go exercise for hours and hours and hours and hours on end and be able to, to do it again. Right. And I just, it's a wonderful sense of meditation and accomplishment. So super, super long answer to your question of, I find that contemplation is, is, is a wonderful side benefit of endurance athletics. And part of the thing that I contemplated was uh, what, watching what my sister was going through and watching people at Relay for Lives and at, after doing events every year to raise money for um, you know, different cancer organizations was that um, was that people I witnessed that people were and observed that people were really good about dealing with the tasks of their cancer, but not real good at dealing with the emotional side of it. And, and, and that's the same with any kind of trauma. Do you know, like um, when something traumatic happens with a coworker, everybody kind of rallies around getting them uh, food and, and taking care of the kids if they need to do that and helping them navigate time off. But the, the actual emotional, hard, really hard stuff about the trauma, we all kind of just, mm, we don't deal with that. And I thought to myself, wouldn't it be cool if I could write some stories, uh, true stories, r- real people that, that, uh, that were dealing with. Um, tr- very traumatic things like like cancer or being a caregiver for 40 years or being an oncologist or whatever. Right. If I got really got into their heads about their stories um, and and could and could tell those in a truthful, authentic way, um, it might help people. And so that that became uh, the genesis of this of this of the last book. Wow. And this fundraiser, is this the same fundraiser that you do every year or is it different in your sister's memory? No, my, so my sister's name is June and, and I would do a for June in June. Ah. Okay. So every year for, for a number of years, I did like a, I did a hundred mile race or a 85 mile run, or I, I did four marathons back to back, or I did all these wacky things that would, yeah, a lot of people supported me and it was really fun. We raised money and that, that was still that. doing it? I'm not doing the four June and Junes just because it, um, yeah, I, I'm not that organized all the time, but I did it for, for several years. But, um, what I did do is, um, uh, didn't take a real gap in that until uh, the book came along. And then, um, each one of the book participants, I asked them, what is the organization of choice for you? What, what do you have an affinity to? What do you have an allegiance to? Um, who took care of you um, or who, who gave you your career or whatever? And, and, and then I'd like 100% of the proceeds from the book to go support that. And that includes the, the you know, cancer centers like Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida and That's NYU wonderful. and uh, if anyone um, listening to this wants to get a list of these organizations that mm-hmm. the book is supporting, where would they find that, David? Is on, is on so, your- yeah, I didn't want to be shy about it. So it's actually in the book. I, I, I list each one of the organizations. Cycle of Lives, good. In Cycle of Lives. It's on the website. The cycle of, If you go to cycleoflives.org, you can see, and it's they're all great organizations. It's Children's Hospital of LA and American Cancer Society and Perlmutter Cancer Institute over there in New York and a lot, a lot of good places. What a motivation for your book to continue to do yeah. well. Is that, yeah, is that, is that they, get, they get the money. So, you know, I mean, there's not a lot of money in books, so I, I don't want to make it seem like it's, it's so benevolent, but, but, um, but really the greater good is, is, is like you, you mentioned every once in a while, you get feedback that drives you to know you're doing the right thing. And you shared a story with me before we, before we started talking about that. And it's really cool that you can have an impact on people's lives. And pretty regularly, I'll get a note uh, or, 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 you know, reach out from a professional or from a person who just goes, man, dude, that, that was a, that was a book that helped me. And, um, you know, I, I remember this one where, where this doctor I spoke to told me that he read the book the first time and he was in horror because he realized he had no idea what his patients were going through. And he felt so bad 
that he didn't, he didn't have that awareness. And then he read it the second time as a person, not as a doctor. And he goes, man, did I feel for these people and realize that everybody's going through something and you, you might not even know it, even if you're helping them go through something that might be the, not be the thing they're going through. Is it, which points to your other, what you said before about how people skirt the emotional. Yeah. Piece. Even when you're working on people, you're a doctor, you're saving their lives. You don't, you're not connected to what's going on within that person other than those cells that are duplicating. Yeah. Duplicate and look, we're, we're right. And, and we're all just passer buyers in everybody else's life, right? Everybody's living their own life, but, but, but it just, it just adds to the, the thought that we just don't know what people are going through or what they have gone through. And so when your friend says to you, Irene, like, look, I appreciate the help, but I don't, I don't really need it. I'm fine. I'm really fine. Well, maybe what they're saying to you is I, there's no way I can rely on you because everybody I've ever relied on has totally abandoned me. And I'm way too afraid to show you weakness because there's no way that I'm going to allow you to abandon me. So no, I'm fine. I'm really good. I don't need you. Right. You don't know what people are going through. You don't know what they've gone through. You're absolutely you right. You're absolutely you know, and, right. And, and so if we take a moment, especially uh, with the people that we care about, and I think that this book um, does allow you to really feel for the people um, and, and relate it to people that you might know in your own life, but really with the people we care about and, and the people that we want stronger connections with, if we can just maybe be uh, empowered to allow ourselves to navigate the difficult waters, say the wrong things. It's okay sometimes to say the wrong things. It's okay to push when you maybe shouldn't push because maybe that's what you need to do. Like this, I, I'm hoping the book empowers people to, it's a to, book. to, to make, thank you, to, to make a deeper connection with the people that are in their lives. Well, let me ask you this because you're so eloquent. Are you available to speak? I'm sure you must be available to speak about your book in front of groups and online. So mm -hmm. how can people connect someone's listening to this and they'd like you to speak to their book club or, sure. or whatever is going on. How can, how, how do they connect with you? Yeah, I do a lot of that. It's, it's fun. Uh, sometimes I do it for free. Uh, it's a book club. I, I did, I've had a wonderful experience with this uh, cancer support group in Alaska and, and they read the book and most of the uh, people had uh, been through cancer. Most of them were women with breast cancer. And I think four of the stories, one is a, as an oncologist that specialized in breast cancer. And I think three others were, were, were women that had gone through or survivors whose, whose uh, lost one had gone through breast cancer and, and m m me talking with them about their book and their experience. It's just, it was a wonderful, wonderful thing. So I love, love, love doing it. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, just connect with me, you know, obviously for larger groups, you know, I, I, you know, I'll travel and do whatever, but, um, you know, it's a passion and it, it you know, it doesn't matter what I comes to me. You it's, and it feeds them. It's, it's just, yeah. it, that's how I feel about this podcast. It's both yeah. ways, you know, it brings me so much joy to help people, but I'm also being, I'm also being told that it's helping so many people and it's, it's just, it's such which a, in turn helps you, you yeah, know, it's, 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 it's just yeah. a beautiful but it's a good, it's a positive yeah. circle. It's not that positive. It's not that negative cycle no. that, that we're all on at one point in our lives, right? It's a positive right. cycle and you just Absolutely. want more of it. <laughs> it's like a round robin. It's beautiful. Yeah. Um, are you doing any more new, any new projects, David? What have you got on tap these days? I, I am. <clears throat> I've got, always got the projects I'm working on. I'm doing some nonfiction or some fiction books that I'm working on and I'm, I'm, I'm always promoting the, the current books because, you know, as an author, you want to continue to build your audience so that publishers think that you're, uh, you're going to make them some money. So they'll be more interested in your next book. So, uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm not a household name. So the more households I get into, the more chance I have of becoming that so that I can hopefully impact people with my writing. That's, well, that's the goal. You deserve to be a household name. You're a really remarkable <laughs> guy. Uh, you got my vote all the way. Um, yeah, I'm a big, I'm a big guy in my own mind, at least. <laughs> <laughs> that's good though. That's a big, that's a big advance from where you once were. Good that's for you. Truth. Good observation. Good observation. So you of all people, what's your message based on your own <laughs> healing story with rebirth about the importance of healing and rebirth that you want to share with all of us? Why should we mm. go to all this trouble to turn our lives around and recreate in a better way? Yeah, well, look, you'll get this more than most people because of what you've been through, right? And, 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 and it's not a, I'm not prescribing anything and I'm certainly not preaching, but I, I will tell you 
that there is, an, for at least for me, and I, and I know I'm not speaking for you, but I, I'm sure it speaks to you, that whenever, whenever the time comes for you to not believe that you can be optimistic, you can still be optimistic. I, I mean, all you got to do is just, just believe and be optimistic that your best days are ahead of you. And, and sometimes we have to go through really difficult things and things that, that are just not fair. And they're just, they're not good. I mean, they're really bad things happen to good people. And, but, but out of that, maybe not right then, maybe not near in the future, maybe, but may, maybe not for a while, things can become better things. You can evolve. You can rebirth yourself. You, you can see what the world gives you on your, around the next corner. And, and I, I guess for me, that the thing that drives me is to believe, I always believe my best days are ahead of me. And until I don't, I, I'm always going to believe that. And, and, and it's a wonderful feeling because even though sometimes I have dark days and dark moments and bad things happen, um, luckily nothing like monstrously tragic has happened to me. Um, but you know, I mean, what, what, whatever, I just, I just believe that that's the thing that we should all do. And so I, I would say, I mean, look at where you came from, from what you've been through just a few years ago. Right. Um, uh, you know, and you're not in the place you hope to be, not the place you thought you would be back then, but the place where you're at right now, you have an optimistic, um, wonderful, vibrant view of each day, which, why shouldn't you have that? And so my days I, are filled with gratitude. I must right. say, and, I wake I, up in the morning, I go, ah, I'm here. Right. I'm loved. Yeah. I'm doing good things. And and so I, I I feel like even though it sounds kind of preachy, it's it's really not. It's just a mindset that I think is a wonderful mindset to have, which is to believe that your best days are ahead of you. And as as long as you continue to believe that, it it makes you look forward to waking up every day, right. which is a it's a really great great place to be. I also think part of your healing and rebirth was that you didn't stay stuck. You kept learning. And you kept moving ahead there. So, I mean, that that's very admirable. And I, and I have to say, I have that philosophy too. Where can I go? Mm -hmm. How can I, how can I move forward? I'm not going to stay in this, this space over here that I don't yeah, like. And uh, if I could just add one thing to that, sure. I mean, is, is from, from endurance. I also learned that uh, more from endurance athletics as well, because when you're doing something like a 10 hour run in the desert in 120 degree heat, <gasps> or something like that, right? You're going to get some peaks and valleys and the valleys are really, really hard. Like it hurts. It's just not fun, but you're self-imposing it. So I guess it's kind of fun, but, um, but I mean, the, the thing is, is that if you, if you quit, right, nobody's going to care. Nobody's, nobody's watching or whatever, but, but, but that, you know, you, you kind of found your limit, but if you could just figure out a way to be unstuck, just take one step forward, just, just, eventually eventually it's it's going to get better if you could just unstuck right if you could just take right. one more step just go a little bit past that line just take one more step forward eventually it'll get better and so it'll eventually get easier it'll eventually they'll get, you'll get a tailwind eventually the right things will happen just when when things get really 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 hard self-imposed or otherwise just figure out a way to keep taking a step forward right it's, even it, if you and, need to get a little help with the fort or whatever and, and, right. and endurance athletics taught me that for sure that's great and would you say that's part of the uh your formula for finding joy in life or do you have anything else you'd like to add to that no that 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 really that really is it and it's not easy it, you know I, I i can't say i every moment that everything bad happens to me i go woohoo my best days are ahead of me and i'm going to take a positive step forward it, it's not you know i, I don't want to be trite but yeah the the thing that brings me uh, joy is honestly you know, I can look in the mirror and go, well, you're still trying to be your best person for you. And you're still optimistic and you still think your best days are ahead of you. So how in the world could that not be great? Right? How can that not be joyful? So, you know, that's, I, yeah, that's, I guess that's my secret, I guess the first time metaphorically and really that I stood in front of the mirror and said, who the heck are you and what do you want to be? At least I, now I have some of those answers. Right, I think, thing. right, that gives you joy. I mean, in my opinion, you look in that mirror, you like what you see these days. A lot more than I did the guy from, from the past, for sure. Right. I have, yeah. the same, you know, same, I'm with you there. David, your life choices, 
you know, I'm your fan. You're, you're so truly inspiring. <laughs> and you are a tremendous role model for healing and rebirth. Thank you for opening your heart and sharing you, your truly incredible personal story with all of us today. And I wholeheartedly encourage everyone to check out my fascinating interview with you. It was a good one about your book, Cycle of Lives, which is an important and really mesmerizing read. And I want to thank you from my heart for this fabulous interview and your remarkable, gracious generosity of spirit. And here's a reminder, everyone, that you can see the show notes and all grief and rebirth podcast episodes on IreneWeinberg.com. And make sure to follow us and like us on social at, at Irene S. Weinberg on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and especially on YouTube. Like, subscribe, and hit notify, everyone, to make sure you will get the inspiring new interviews coming your way. Thank you so much. And if you'd like to be a part of the Rebirth series, please send me an email to hello at irenweinberg.com. As I like to say, to be continued, many blessings, and bye for now. (music) 